Good morning, Connection Church. It's good to be here. I'm Steve, and it's always a privilege and an honor to preach God's word. Talking about the real Jesus. And men, uh, I'm going to go on a little rant for us here for about 30 seconds. I'm going to talk about weddings today. Men, we like weddings, but if you have daughters, we end up having to pay for them. <laughs> Even though we attend, it turns into our wife's anniversary. Anybody can say amen to that, man? You scared? A little bit. And the third thing, you know, we're going to talk about Jesus working a miracle at a wedding. Sometimes we need Jesus to work a miracle with those in-laws. Am I right? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Well, we're going to talk about the real Jesus today. We're going to talk about a wedding that you don't want to miss if you don't know Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. For everyone that has their Bibles, turn to John chapter 2, and we're going to start reading at verse number 1. John 2, and we're going to start reading at verse number 1. When you have it, can you say amen? Thank you. Still here a few pages. And the word of God says, on the third day, a wedding took place in Canal of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, if you underline in your Bible, underline there, when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. I want to pause right there for a second because I want you guys to understand how this stage is being set right now for Jesus to deliver a miracle. In our lives, we need a need for a miracle. And right here we see that the wine had ran out, but something that's ironic to me, and we all know that Jesus is the son of Mary, we understand that, and they have a great relationship, but why right here, why right now, is she asking Jesus and talking to Jesus about the wine? Church, I'm here to tell you the reason she came to Jesus discussing wine is because she realized that there was a need at this wedding, and in the Jewish wedding, if the wine runs out, this normally lasted around seven days, and they would eat, and they would have a good time, and if you were in charge of making sure that the wine was supplied there throughout this time, for it to go out would be a bad thing. I don't know about Vidalia for sure, but when things go bad, it, people a lot of times they will talk and talk for a long time if things don't go well. If you throw a party and it doesn't go well, people are going to talk about you. Right here we see Mary sees that, man, there's a problem. This wine has ran out. So she goes to Jesus and she makes a request. Let me tell you why that's significant. Because she's already showing that she has faith in Jesus, and that's extremely important right here in this text. Jesus, the wine is ran out. Let's read verse 4. And before I say this, I don't know if any of us could say this to our moms. What does that have to do with me, woman? Question mark. I don't know about you guys, how I was raised. If I said that to my mom, I wouldn't be standing here any longer. What does that have to do with me, woman? In your Bible, it's read. That's exactly what Jesus said. It's a small rebuke here, but let me tell you why. He's not, he's not disrespecting his mom. He's actually giving a hint at, even though, mom, I love you, and you my mother, I have a bigger responsibility here. I understand, Mom, that you're thinking about wine. I understand that you're thinking about wine, but, Mom, in the future, and I'm already thinking about how I'm coming to change the world and transform the world. Wine at this party is important, but people's soul being saved and the people that I'm going to die for is more important. The second thing I want to bring out in this text here is talking about the bigger picture. Right here in verse number four, what does that have to do with me, woman? We just mentioned a need for a miracle. And I want you guys to understand this. When the stage is set and Jesus is getting ready, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, he's going to turn water into wine. There was a need there. 
But all throughout the Bible, we see so many places where people needed, had a need for a miracle. What about the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years that exhausted all of her resources? She'd done everything. Then she decides, you know what? I've dealt with this for 12 years. Jesus is coming by. I'm actually going to get down and walk through the streets. I do whatever I have to do. Even if people almost trample on me, it's not that important. I just got to get and get a touch of Jesus and I can be healed. You find that story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke 17, it talks about the guys that have leprosy. I could imagine having leprosy and having to cry unclean, which means get away from me because I have to be on the outskirts of these cities. Nobody wants to touch me. I can't even get a hug. They needed a miracle. The stage is set for a miracle. They have an opportunity to have an encounter with Jesus. Jesus heals them, but one of them decides to turn around and come back because I believe he realized that that's who my Lord and Savior is. Talking about a need. What about the paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2? Talking about a stage being set. It wasn't even about his faith. His friends thought so much of him that they couldn't get in the door. We're going to make a hole from the ceiling to let you in. And this is extremely important, church. Jesus said, I'm going to heal you, but I'm also going to forgive your sins. So many times we ask Jesus and he will perform the miracle, but the miracle is what he done for us on Calvary. There's nothing wrong with being healed of a sickness. There's nothing wrong with Jesus doing amazing things in your life. What about him transforming your life? Talking about the bigger picture, Jesus hadn't went public yet as a miracle working God. That's why he told his mom, hey, mom, I understand about the wine, but woman, hey, got some bigger things to talk about here. This is something that always touches my heart. Why would Jesus be in a miracle-making business at this wedding? Why would he turn water into wine? Why did he care so much for what Mary had said? I believe Mary had a relationship with Jesus. I believe Mary also had faith in Jesus. And we're going to see right here in the text to come. But I want you guys to think about this. Jesus also will get into intimate details of our lives. We don't have a problem, church. We don't have an issue giving Jesus the big things of our lives. What if I told you he wants the small ones as well? He can handle all of them. I want you guys to flip over with me to Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to read this. I want you to listen. Tell me if Jesus gets in the details. Matthew 6, verse 25 says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. I'll tell you why that's important. I'm normally at 9 o'clock. Uh, church guy, you know, I'm here at 11 right now, so if you hear something, that's my stomach probably. Don't worry about your life or what you would eat or what you would drink or about your body or what you would wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more worthy than they? Can any of you add one, one moment to your lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that they, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God's clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? You of little faith. So don't worry about what you will eat. Don't worry about what you would drink or what you would wear. I want to pause right there and say that always give me confidence because so many times if we're dealing with a terrible sickness, cancer or death, or we're dealing with all these tough issues, yes, give those to Jesus. But he wants to handle those small problems too. He is a God of details. What does that have to do with me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Let's continue to read. Verse 5. This is where I could pause and close the Bibles and we could actually dismiss. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servant. I'm going to pause right there. So Jesus says, what does this have to do with me, woman? My time has not yet come, which is saying, I have more important things to do. 
Mary responds to her son <laughs> by saying, serve it. Do whatever he says. Can you guys do me a favor? For all of you that believe, look to the person that's next to you and say, do what Jesus says. No, tell them like you mean it. Say, do what Jesus says. All right. Amen. Let's go home. We can go home right there. Do what Jesus says. Why is that important? I believe Mary right here is showing tremendous faith. She went to Jesus. The stage is set for him to deliver a miracle. Jesus said, hey, I understand this wine, but my time has not yet come. I haven't shown people that I'm this miracle working God just yet. Give me a little time. And Mary says, wait, let's do, it. do whatever he says. Do whatever he says. Why is that so difficult for us? Is it because of our pride? I know I had a ton of pride. I wanted to do it my way. Is it because we don't want to look foolish in the eyes of other people? Sometimes serving Jesus will have us looking foolish to the world. I'll give you guys an example. Love your enemies. Raise your hand. That's a ton of fun. We'll delete someone off Facebook. No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Pray for those that spitefully misuse you. Man, oh, I just, when I woke up today, all the people that's been talking about me at work, I'm just going to pray for them because I love them. Give generously. Be a cheerful giver. There are some things in the Bible that are not so easy to do for us, but we have to do what he says if we're true believers. Do whatever he says. And on the other end, how do we know if we're doing what Jesus said? I don't know about you guys, but growing up in the South, a lot of times, have someone ever walked up to you, hey, man, got a word for you. God told me to tell you this. I was like, sure. I'll tell you guys a short story. A buddy of mine wasn't in church. We grew up together. Wasn't in church. Came by my house one day after he had went to a revival, like his first time in a long time, uh, going to church. He's like, Steve, man, I got some news to share with you. I'm thinking it's something. He's going to get married or something like that. He's like, man, I know you love preaching. Man, I heard Jesus said, you're going to be a preacher. Talking about himself. It's like, you sure? You don't go to church. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe you're a believer. But Jesus told you to go, that you're going to be a preacher. He said, I'm pretty sure of it. And so for the next 30 minutes, I just told him all the horrible stories that I know of from being in ministry. <laughs> And right after that conversation, he was like, yeah, I don't know if it was Jesus. Let me tell you guys something. This is how you know. These are some habits that we have to have. And you got to read God's word in order to know God's voice. A lot of times we want Jesus to just come rain down and write on the, on the wall. Maybe he will. I don't know. But a lot of times when we're not hearing from God, it's because we're being lazy. You got to be able to open up God's word. This is one that's difficult too. And you got to have some people in your life for wise counsel, godly counsel. Those individuals that you don't want to talk to because you know they're going to tell you the truth. Because you know we all have people that are going to be in our corner no matter what. Win, lose, draw, right or wrong, they're going to be on our side. Not those individuals. I'm talking about those individuals that you know they're going to hold you accountable and call you out and you don't want to hear them and you get angry when you see them coming. Those individuals. That's not going to tell you what they think. They're going to tell you what the word of God says. Those are the individuals. Wise counsel. And here's another one. And I taught on this about a week ago. And you got to spend time in prayer. You have to pray. You have to continually to seek God's face. That's how you do what he says. That's how you do what he says. Do whatever he says. That would do all of us well, to do whatever Jesus says. Let's continue to read. Now, six stone jars had been set there for Jewish purification. I don't want to take too long here, but I just want to say this. During that time, during this time, Jews loved to wash their hands, their outer body. They didn't want to be dirty. They did so many things before going into this bit in order to the synagogue. They cleaned up really well on the outside. These jars, to me, a great rep representation of sometimes what we do today. You guys tell me if I'm wrong. I can remember coming up 
And people get invited to church. They would say this, hey, I'm coming to church. I got to go put on my church clothes. Anyone ever heard of that? Seemed like to me, church clothes would be whatever clothes I go to church in. But no, people would go dress up, put on their Sunday's best. As a kid, I didn't always understand that. As I got older, let me tell you why that's so significant. Because also, when they were putting on those clothes, they were putting on a whole other person as well. They were putting on a different face. They were going so they can be accepted. They would go and be something that they weren't to get embraced and try to be accepted by people that probably wasn't going to accept them anyway. Church isn't some religious club that we just let good people into. The church is for the sick. Can I give you guys uh, something? Don't tell, don't tell Pastor Billy I said this. We all have some sick in us. All of us have a sin problem. And if you don't think you do, read 1 John. So when it comes to who we are, who we're supposed to be, Jesus wants the real you, not some dressed up version of you that's not real. I say this all the time, the, the toughest person to help is the person that knows that they need help but would prefer to act like they don't need it. These, these six stone water jars used for purification, Jews would go and wash their hands and their bodies and all these things in the water. And I'm going too fast here, but I got to say it anyway. For Steve Edwards, I didn't need water. Brothers, I needed the blood of Jesus to be dipped in. Water wasn't going to do it for me. And guess what? Water wasn't going to do it for these Jews either. As much as this is a story about wine, this is a story about the blood of Jesus. As much of it is a story about Jesus turning water into wine, this is about spiritual transformation. Let's continue to read. Let's back up and stay at six. Now six water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. That's a little point right here. That's a lot of water that's getting ready to get turned into wine. That's a lot of water that's getting ready to get turned into wine. Verse 7, fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. Verse 9, the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine. He did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. I want to pause right there. If you, if you have notes, please write this in your notes. It's amazing to me. The people of this story, people that we just gloss over, so many people had no clue why the water turned into wine. Isn't it amazing the people that were serving the people knew? A principle that we all have to live by when we claim to know Christ, we have to be in the business of serving other people. Lose yourself at the service of others. I heard it said like this, Serve and serve well, but also when you're waiting on Jesus, do what waiters do and serve. Do what waiters do and serve. Lose yourself in the service of others. It's amazing to me, all these important people at this wedding, the people that knew where the miracle came from, were the people that were serving. How amazing is that? The head waiter didn't know when the water was turned to wine, he didn't know where it came from. I'm going to ask you guys a personal question. Don't answer it right now. But it's something I want you to think about. Talking about spiritual transformation. The head waiter didn't know where the wine came from. Do people know when you turn from water to new wine? Have you shared that information with people? Sometimes I feel like we want the credit for being good. Our righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyesight of God. Have you told people about who you used to be and now who you are in Christ? We once were water, now we're new wine. Have you told someone? 
So many times we get embarrassed about what we used to be. Why be embarrassed? We're not that same person anymore. The only people that should worry about the past are the ones that still live there. Satan can't use that to destroy me. I'm using that to tear down his kingdom. And more people that are going through some of the same things that I went through back then, I'm going to help them because we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony. Have you shared that with someone? The head waiter didn't know. You know who saved you. You know why you don't have that habit. You know who got you through death. You know who got you through sickness. Have you told someone? Have you told someone? If not, get to telling people. Those the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told him, everyone sets out to find wine first. Then after people are drunk, they're inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum together with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they only stayed there only a few days. Something I want you guys to understand and I want you to know. Inward transformation requires one thing, a touch from Jesus. Inward transformation, where you're not pretending. Something that I love about having the young ones in here, if you guys ever want to see someone worship God, I'm talking about just pure worship, watch a five, six, or seven-year-old when their favorite Christian song comes on. I have a three-year-old, three her favorite song is uh, Maverick City's Bless Me. That's her favorite song in the world. Every morning when I take her to daycare, we have to listen to it. Dad doesn't have the radio, even, does he, even though he pays the car note. Whatever she wants to listen to is her radio. When I put the song on, sometimes I'm looking in the mirror. Her eyes are closed, and she's singing it as hard as she can. As hard as she can. And thank God she has a good voice. She didn't take out to her mom. I can sing, so she takes out to me just playing that. <laughs> she's singing it as hard as she can. Because guess what? She's not worried about who's looking. She's not worried about what other people are going to say. In those moments, in my mind, I'm saying the only thing that Landon cares about right now is singing her favorite song to Jesus. Her favorite song to Jesus. A real encounter with Jesus produces internal transformation that will also lead to other people being able to know that you're a Christian. When you head to work, it should ooze out of you. It's almost like you shouldn't even be able to hide it. Sometimes I'm in places or I'm speaking to certain groups that may not necessarily be tied to the church, and sometimes they say, hey, you know, we are such and such, and just be mindful of what you say. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't always do well at those. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, Sometime in Mississippi, we developed this thing called the can't help it. I can't help but to speak of his goodness. I can't help but to praise him. I can't help but to worship him. Sometimes it just comes out. Make sure you let people know. Make sure you let people know that your life has been transformed. I think about Jewish purification, and they're doing all these things trying to clean up the outside just like we try to do today. The most important thing that you can ever do, the most important thing that you can ever do is recognize who Jesus is and turn your life and live for him. Inward transformation. Inward transformation. I mentioned this earlier. The Jews using these water jars to wash their hands and do all these perfect, all these things. And sometimes when I was studying, a few weeks ago, I was thinking back just on my life and, um, and how water wouldn't have worked for me. The only thing that was going to help me was the blood of Jesus. And sometimes I think we gloss over what Jesus did for us. 
Sometimes, do we think about the lashes he took for us? And Jesus dying for the very people that spat on him. Jesus dying for the individuals that didn't appreciate him. People that studied the Bible, studied the law, that should have saw Jesus coming from miles away, had a hand in his death. He died for them too. The more and more I think about that, I realize that I was in that crew as well. My sin caused him to be nailed to that cross. My sin, me not being willing to forgive others, me, he shed his blood for me. In church, at one point in time in my life, I was proud to be water. And I say this all the time, it's amazing when we're out living for the world. Man, we can be so loud. We can express, you know, every now and then I go to some Georgia games and, you know, all those people are bad people if you're a Georgia fan. Woo, I'm just joking. There is nothing like being at, and I'm an Auburn fan and, and everyone knows that, but it's nothing like being at a dog's game and they score a touchdown and grown adults 25 to 100 start barking like dogs in there. <laughs> and proud of it and waving their feet. I'm talking about, and I'm sitting there just disgusted. <laughs> what if we can take that same enthusiasm, that same exact enthusiasm like we have at a ball game when our team scores a touchdown? What if we take that same enthusiasm and we spread God's word. And you share your testimony. You talk about turning water into wine. Because church, at one time, we were all water. Not the pure kind. Because we were dipped in the blood of Jesus. Having a real touch from Jesus. And I would pray all the time, God, not even just my body, my whole entire life needs to be dipped in your blood. Don't leave any, leave me submerged. <laughs> because I want to come out as new wine. As I get ready to close, we've talked about a need for a miracle. We've talked about God's timing and how, yes, he will create and he will do a miracle in your life. But the biggest miracle is when he saved us. The third thing we talked about today the easiest one to remember, do what Jesus says. Do what Jesus says. Even when it's uncomfortable. Even when it's tough. Can I give you guys another one? Even when people are not going to appreciate it. Do what Jesus says. And the last thing we talked about was real purification, inward transformation we can't clean ourselves up if you don't know Jesus to be your Lord and Savior there is nothing you can possibly do to handle what you have on the inside there's only one cure for that and that's the blood of Jesus I don't care who you go to who your therapist is Jesus is the answer. In my closing, a wedding you don't want to miss. Every time I think of the word wedding, <laughs> I'm a girl dad. <laughs> I have two, two daughters, so I'm going to have to borrow some money from somebody in here. <laughs> the wedding that you don't want to miss is not your daughter's wedding or your son's wedding. It's the invitation. It's the invitation of accepting Jesus' hand and becoming and being part of the church. Being part of a living body where there's accountability, where there's love, 
compassion, encouragement. Jesus being the groom. Don't say no. I always picture Jesus just extending his hand. And I often think of this. How can something that God created, and the only reason it actually exists is because of him, turn around and say no to him? Sometimes it's because people in our lives have thought we've been Christian for a long time, so we're afraid to show people that, no, I really did know Jesus. We worry about what other people in our families are going to say. We worry about what our buddies are going to say. Let me tell you the most important saying you will ever hear. Well done. My good and faithful servant. The wedding you don't want to miss. The wedding you don't want to miss is the invitation that Jesus is extending to all of those that who don't know him. You don't have to stay water, unpurified, dirty angry, depressed, full of anxiety, full of heartache. You don't have to stay there. You can have a touch from Jesus. He dipped in his blood and come out new wine. I'm going to ask you guys to do me a favor and close your eyes. something I want you guys to think about. For you to know Jesus, I just want you to reminisce about where you were before you knew him. Think about where your life could have been if it wasn't for our Lord and Savior. Think about all the times that Satan tried to sip you like wheat. Think about all the times where it could have went really bad. Now I want you to think about that day that you made the best decision that you could ever make. And that was giving Jesus Christ your life. Now I want you to think about how that's changed your family forever. Think about that brother and sister that now know Christ. Think about that child that now knows Christ. Think about that coworker that now knows Christ. Think about your community and how God changed it. And think about you. I want you guys to open your eyes and look at me, and I'm done. Jesus is the purification system. His blood. This story, even, it, even though it's titled in the Bible, if you have the CSB, Jesus turning water into wine. This story is about spiritual transformation. It's about transforming us from going to one place and going to another. It's about transforming us from death to life. Let us pray. God, we're so thankful for your word. God, your word is such a great reminder of just how good you are and how compassionate you are. 
Mary showed amazing faith by asking you to take care of the wine problem. God, you did one better. You took care of the wine problem, but you also took care of the sin problem in our world. And God, for the rest of our lives, we will sing your praises. We are on Team Jesus, and we're excited about it. We're not going to whisper your praises. God, we want to dance like David danced. We want it to be like fire shut up in our bone like Jeremiah talks about. Allow us to remain on fire for you. And the only reminder, God, that we need to remain on fire is to think about you turning us into new wine with a simple touch of you and your blood. God, we love you and we praise you. And it is in Jesus' name I pray.